time that, uh, you know, we're going to understand the nature of this war. Now, I'm going to give you one aspect of war, spiritual war that we're in right now, so that we can make corrections. Folks, it is my intention. I don't want to see anybody beguiled away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. What does that mean? That means we have no doctrine worth telling. But the Lord Jesus has already spoken. Things have already been decreed. Revelation has been given. We have enough. Now it's time to operate what the Lord gave us and stop looking for this, these new things because we don't agree with the old things or the established things. So we're going to talk about the first portion of the nature of the warfare that's getting everybody. And do you guys have an idea of what the battle, the first battle, the battle that's taking place right now is something you're going to have to overcome or you probably won't make it? Why do I say you won't make it? We also have to clarify something. Many of you have a question. Once saved, always saved. That pops up now and again, doesn't it? Certainly popped up in the chat room one late night. People thinking that uh, here's their thoughts. Once you give your life to Christ, that one time you're forever saved, right? Isn't that what people believe? How many of you in the chat room believe that? Because we're family, you can, you can answer honestly. Don't ever be embarrassed to answer something honestly. We had a precious brother, by the way, who gave me his testimony. I did read his testimony. I'm not going to mention the name, but a precious brother. But I did not respond to him concerning his testimony. Right? So he didn't know what to think. He didn't know what to think. And um, the other day, yesterday, I believe it was, uh, the evening hours, if I'm not mistaken, you have to forgive me. I've been working uh, a lot here lately, a lot. I will continue to do so, so don't advise me to get some rest. I will not. I will do whatever it takes, whatever's necessary to get through a few things. But uh, this gentleman sent his testimony, and he thought, he really thought his testimony offended me. Right? He did. Now, there was a time gap between the testimony and the time when we actually spoke about it, and um, he thought uh, that somehow I was offended by his testimony. He told a truth of himself, what he didn't know. He didn't know how I felt about it because of no response. Right? So anyway, we cleared that up. And I told him something I really meant. I don't know anybody unless I know what they're capable of in both darkness and light. I don't know you if all I see is light. If all I see is the good part of you, I don't know you. And, and to be frank with you, there's no one I can trust unless I see the dark side of them. Now, you would think it's the good side that makes you love a person, not with me. It's the dark side that makes me love a person. The dark side is what you really are in the earth. The side of light, right? The side of light is your transition, your change, what the Lord is doing in your life. I've tried to contact Angela a few times. There's no response. I, at last I heard Angela was with her sister. She was with her sister. Her sister uh, is in the, she's been in the hospital for a long time. And uh, sometimes she goes back and forward. And, and so Angela's with her sister, I believe. She said, uh, somebody said she was in the ICU. Okay, so lift her and her family up. Lift her and her family up. If you would, please. But uh, I, I don't have any status. I've been trying to get one. I haven't heard from Angela in a few days. So, um, Keep her lifted up. Just keep her lifted up. Okay? Do that. She's a precious woman of God. And um, all of us are human beings. And aren't we? And sometimes we go through things we've not gone through before, and it can be quite tasking. So keep her lifted up as best you can. All right? All right. The gentleman, by the way, when he shared of himself the depths of his life, I thought that to be precious. Right? You have to understand, I'm a person who is, uh, has old ways, I guess you could say that. Right? Having been on the battlefield, I don't trust anybody 
who shows me goody two shoes all the time. I can't do that. I need to know the whole person. I have to know what that person cannot do and what they can do. It only makes me care for a person much more when I see the dark side. I'm not impressed with light. Light, the light side of you, the, the part that is truthful and right is where you are supposed to be. The dark side of you is where you came from. I don't know a person who just shows me what they're supposed to be. Right? But to know a person, you must know their fallacies. You must know where they're capable of falling from so that you can truly protect them. If I knew that a brother would fall because of alcohol, right? I wouldn't plan a trip. And on every route, there's a bar or a store where you can buy alcohol. I wouldn't do that. Sometimes we think backward. And we have no repair in our lives. That gentleman is on his way to one of the greatest victories one can witness. So you have to fall way down in the dumps to begin to confess who you really are. That's how you know somebody's going to have the greatest victory. That's how you know they're going to break free all the way. I find that precious. All right? Mm. But this is about family. And I know that you have not had good examples of family in your lives. Not everybody, nor have I. But my example is Christ and Jesus. Right? Jesus Christ, the Father the prophets and the disciples and the apostles, the children of Israel, the trampling of Jerusalem underfoot, that's not an evil act. Most of you see that as something horrific, harsh, and everything else. You can't understand why the Lord would allow that to happen. His love, that's why. You see, sometimes everything in a person must be broken all the way or they will not turn to the Lord. You ever try to do something your way? And you'll tell everybody, I don't know how to do it, but you keep doing it your way. Somebody advises you on the way to do it concerning the Lord, and you're not strong enough to do it, and you keep doing it your way. So the truth is, the only way you can be broken, right, is by God who will tie everybody's hands up where they can't do a thing. They can't bail you out anymore. Then when you're broken, then you'll see the truth before it's too late. He'll do it every single time. He'll do it to me. He'll do it to anybody because he loves us. Sometimes people, they say, well, I'm going to be in a bad light. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't care if I'm in a bad light to you. I want to be truthful. I'm going to grow in the Lord. I don't need a hindrance. Do you know what happens if I fall flat on my face? You may fall on your face too. If I, with a fake face and a fake spirit, walk forward in fakeness, I will destroy you. That's why you never hear me repeat those things that other people have said, do you? No, no. I can't talk to somebody else's experience. What's in me is what the Lord has brought me through. What's in me comes out of my mouth all the time. The same way I speak to you guys is the same way I have conversations with everybody else. I may be a little more stern on a one-to-one -one basis. In fact, I'm very stern. I refuse to give up on a person and give in to certain things. You don't fight for a person by agreeing with them. All that does is lengthen their destruction. I'm not going to do that. Many people out there in COT, some people have me backwards. They don't understand me. Right? They just don't. They don't understand me because I don't live for me. But I'll never give up or turn my back on you. I'll boot you out the chat room, but I'm not going to turn my back on you. I won't do that. I may even think some of your comments are disgusting, but I'll not turn my back on you. You will never be my enemy because you're a flesh. I have an adversary, the devil, who stands against everything of Christ. 
that the Lord would work through me, but you are not my emissary, nor are you my enemy. You are me, and I am you, we are all flesh, prone to the same thing. The battle, the nature of this battle is spiritual. Now, I'm going to give you the first portion of this battle. You guys have a pen and paper. You want to write some of this down? We're going to talk about it so that you can actually step into a victory. It's time to identify it. You really have to identify it. I tell you, it's my intention with all of what I am to see you guys through as far as the Lord will let me. I do not want to speak a falsehood. I do not desire to, to perpetuate some made-up topic. It's not going to help you. It's not going to assist you. Tonight's going to be a little weird in this talk. I don't know how long I'm going to be on. I need to speak to you about the first portion of warfare so that you can analyze it, this battle that we're in. Everybody write down materialism. Can you do that? Materialism. That's the first element in this battle. There's no way you're going to have a victory in this battle without overcoming this mindset, materialism. Now we're going to analyze this. In fact, you can pick over any scripture in the New Testament. It's going to start speaking about materialism. And what is materialism? What is it? Well, let's, let's think about this real quick. Let's not define it according to a lexicon. Right? But let us have revelation from the Spirit. Let's pray first, guys. Heavenly Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Father, we forgive all those who have done anything to us. Father, we forgive them that you may forgive us of our sins. Lord, we lay all flesh and burdens before you. All problems, circumstances, and situations we hand up to you. Father, we ask that you forgive us of our sins and that you send the Holy Spirit and revelation of truth unto all of us. Father, forbid our flesh from speaking this evening. Forbid the man and let the spiritual sayings go forward. Father, we renounce anything of pride, anything that will lift up the flesh. We renounce it. We come boldly to the throne of grace as your children petitioning that you, Lord, give us revelation, each of us. Thank you, Father, for your son, Jesus of Nazareth, of who we do affirm is Lord. We also affirm that we believe upon his name. We accept his doctrine. We accept his walk and the sacrifice matters upon our lives. We thank you, Lord. We admit there was no other way for us to enter into the kingdom, and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Materialism, guys. I'm going to read something to you. God has from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. I need to clarify this. This is a Thessalonians verse 13. It starts, but we are bound to give thanks always to God for you, brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth. Did you hear that? A process. You guys with me? A process. God hath from the beginning chosen you. Wish, Ram, God chose you. Hen, God chose you. Starla, God chose you. Grizz, God chose you. He chose you before you knew anything about him. He chose you. He chose you. Chris, he chose you. Signs, he chose you. Don, 
he chose you. Are you seeing that? He chose you. God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation. Number one, he sent you here to be saved. He has chosen you to identify and believe upon the name of his son. And that salvation comes through sanctification of the spirit. So he chose you, gave you to his son, and your spirit is being sanctified. That's the process upon your life. Your spirit is being sanctified. Through the process of sanctification of the spirit and belief of the truth, you will truly belong to him. From the beginning, he did this. Your spirit is not common. You have the truth. You're affirming that truth. See, if you have the truth, which you do, if I point at a zebra and say it's a zebra, even a child will say, okay. But if I point at a bird to a child who does not know the animals, and I say zebra, the child's going to look at me very strange, because even a child knows the truth. You affirm the truth within you. That hmm? again is Thessalonians, Second Thessalonians, I'm sorry, Second Thessalonians 13. Second Thessalonians verse 13. Scripture fragment starting with God hath. Second Thessalonians 13. Very important because this is the process of bringing life. So you did not, you weren't a goody two-shoes in the flesh, right? You've been going through a process to affirm a truth. Isn't it funny how God gave you the truth, placed that within you, and you've been set in this world to affirm it? Because in the end, you'll say what? When you say Jesus is Lord, it's different from somebody just identifying Jesus as being Lord. Right? Let me give you an example of that. A person in the world, if you say, who is president? They'll say Donald Trump. Won't they? Donald Trump. Right? Everybody knows Donald Trump is president, correct? But imagine this. Imagine you knew Donald Trump personally. All your life, he was a good friend of yours. You knew that although he had flaws, he was a person of integrity who loved the idea of family and fought for people. You knew he had flaws, but you actually believed in what he was saying. So when somebody asks you who is president, you'll say Donald Trump is. And you'll say it with a bit of, of, of seasoning to it, right? If you don't like Donald Trump and somebody asks you who's president, you'll just say Donald Trump. If you really like Donald Trump, and you really believe in what he's doing, somebody asks you who's president, you'll say it differently, Donald Trump. In the world, a person may know who Jesus is. And they'll say, well, Jesus is Lord, right? He's Lord, right? To those who know him, to those who have sinned the most, and they really do appreciate the blood of the Lamb, you know what they'll say? They'll say, Jesus is Lord. See the difference? One is said by identification. The other is said by belief. Do you see the difference? You have been set in this world to affirm God's truth which is his son. It's so funny. A person can never 
choose the truth outside of Christ. Because God gave his word in the form of flesh. And all those who believe in Christ also believe in his word. It is impossible not to believe in Christ, but say you believe in his word. You will know of his word. You won't believe in it. Because if you don't believe in it, you're not going to live by it. You're going to pick it apart and make your own doctrine. But if you believe in the words of Christ, they remain sacred. You'll always change yourself to conform your way to the walk of the Lord. Therefore, you truly do believe. And to you, Jesus is Lord. Is that simple? It's also true. Hmm? That's your process to affirm. Because your affirmation of Jesus being Lord is the proving ground called life. In life, there's a battle. A spiritual battle. A battle that often makes you lose your way. It takes you away from saying Jesus is Lord. It'll cause you to forget. It's a lure in your life. And the first component element in that battle is called materialism. What is materialism? Let me explain something. Many of you really do believe you cannot survive without the substance of this world, right? How many of you believe that? I believe it. I believe that you cannot survive without the substance of this world. I believe that. You would die, right? If you didn't have Christ, you would die. But you're not an ordinary individual. If you didn't have Christ, you would die. If you had Christ, he would give you wisdom. And with wisdom, you would say, well, the body needs so-and-so. Just enough, not a bunch. But the body needs so-and-so. Let's go ahead and get this over with and go forward. Why? Because that is the way of the Lord. The way of the Lord is established from the beginning. We have to eat. We have to drink. Not wine, but water. You know, we have to have fluids and food and things of that nature. That's the way sent by our Lord. That's why you can't fly up in the air and go fly away. You can't strip your clothes off and go fly somewhere. You can't do that. Right? So what does that mean? You're bound by God's laws, not scientific laws. You're bound by God's laws. Now, here's the funny part. <clears throat> in the world of science, they call it scientific laws, physics. You're bound by physics, limitations. But they've taken control of it and become the interpretation of the laws on earth. Therefore, you look to science to see if it's okay for you to do something or not. Instantly, if we had a conversation about people flying, you would say, well, you know, physics dictates. What do you mean physics dictates? No, 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 no. These are God's laws. See how sneaky that is? When you think of the word gravity, you think of Einstein, not the father. You do. You think of Einstein, not the father, don't you? Hmm? So in the world of science, mentally something has happened to you. We know Newton did it, but most people think of Einstein. They do. Because they don't know about Newton. Have you ever spoke to a child? You speak to one of these kids today. Not the old learned folks. Right? We're not talking about inertia and things of that nature. Newton's real discoveries and his obsessions with the end of time. He really was obsessed with the revelation. Are you kidding? Patterns and numbers drove him nuts. Anyway, <clears throat> we're talking about these kids out here. When you say gravity, the first thing they say is Einstein. They don't know who Newton is. They don't. Kershaw or any of those folks, they don't know who they are. All they know is Einstein. Soon they're going to know Watson. But the point is this. They attribute the laws that govern this earth to science, not to the Father. They're taught in school. 
And they're taught to think of scientists as these great smart people. And they know all about the laws, the limitations of the material world. Follow me on this. And so any limitations out there, they're quick to tell you what's impossible because of science. Science has set itself up as an authority on what God has already set in motion. If I told you something spiritually, science would enter into your brain and you would say, that can't be true. Because every time you say, I don't believe that, right? Look at the wave data. People say, well, I don't believe the wave is coming. It's already, it's already here. It's taking effect. Why won't they believe it? They'll say, because I can't see it. Well, nobody else, no scientific experts are saying it. So what have they done? They become blind. But most importantly, what belongs to our Father and what our Father has set into motion, man has taken authority over. And people do give man recognition for the laws of gravity and everything else. Come to find out, gravity is a misnomer. So are 66 of the equations regarding gravity because gravity is wrong boy that's a brain twister it does gravity is not constant it doesn't work like that in advanced laboratories they use a different set of physics without the limitations therefore they can do a lot more They have people fooled. They teach you limitations. Because they teach you limitations, they have developed a trust of you. Most people can't stand NASA, but they can't tell you why. They'll say never a straight answer. That's not telling anybody why. Because the first time something happens, where do they get their data from? NASA satellites. Where do you think all the solar data comes from? If you can't trust NASA, why would you trust their toys that they're allowing you to see? You don't think that that data is filtered. Do you really think you're seeing live images of something? Folks, come on. Think about it. Sometimes they do things on purpose, because if you sow a seed of doubt, let me tell you how I can get you to believe anything. And this is how it works. Don't think I do it. I refuse to do it, but this is how it works. If I wanted you guys to trust my optics, the first thing I would do was put it out there for educational purposes. Lots of people begin to use it, and then you pick it up, and you say, wow, they're showing images of Venus. Let's just say it's Venus, right? And I show it in all different spectrums. And you can download the data from Venus and see the images and everything else. So every once in a while, I'm going to read the numbers of who's using it. And I'll say, wait a minute. The count has gone down. Right? Here's what I do. I take some of the frames and throw a couple things in there. I know something's coming around Venus that's harmless. So here's what I do. I cut the feed. When I cut the feed, oh, now the images have to be true because I'm hiding something. Do you guys see how that works? You want to validate something in the eyes of somebody else? Cut the feed. Oh, now it has to be true. This is how they work. Counterintelligence works the same way. This is how it works. It legitimizes something you thought was not legitimate. That's how it works. Oh, they do that every once in a while, and you will swear by everything. It has to be real. They didn't want us to see it. The fee just automatically cut. So everybody goes and looks for the missing pieces of data that they present. I don't trust This is what we have come to. 
And when you go back and you run the numbers yourself, the numbers do not make sense. Even with the real-time data, it does not make sense. It doesn't make sense. And if you could pull the formulas of the interactions with space radiation, atmospheric radiation, surface radiation, you're going to see point blank the data does not make sense. It does not match. Lord, help me on that one. I probably shouldn't have said that. Anyway, this is part of materialism. To get you to trust in the world of material. Why? Because it has become your God. You don't believe that, do you? How many would just say, well, materialism is not my God? How many would say that? Are material things your God? Are they? Hmm? Many people say, no, it's not. You know what I say? We're going to examine that tonight so we can make some corrections. Don't worry. I'll be gentle in the subject. But I hope that corrections are made. Not for my sake. For your sake. It's time for us to find out who do we really rely upon. Because I'll tell you right now, most of the folks in the house of God do not rely upon the Father. And it's a shame. It's a shameful thing that I have done it. It's a shameful thing that you have done it. It is a shameful thing to be in the house of God that way. Thank God for grace. The Lord knows all about us. He's bringing us through a process. But even he said, how can one hear lest one be sent? Didn't he say that? How can one hear, lest one be sent? So maybe he sent me to stir up the pot, to make you look deeper in his word and say, well, i got to stop doing that. Maybe that's all he sent me for was to stir up stuff. Stir up the worldly stuff inside of you that you go back to the spiritual things. To provoke you into looking deeper into his word of truth. Because when you find the truth, you gather a pearl. I'm going to take a break. We're going to go back and talk about this materialism thing that is defeating so many people. You know how many people are going to cry when the war breaks out? People's lives will be destroyed, not mine. Everything in my life can be destroyed. My life will not be destroyed. Your life will. I've seen people lose a computer, a phone with all their pictures on there, and they cried for weeks. They were in a state of depression. Well, I can't get those pictures back. That person passed away, and it was lost on my phone. And I'm thinking in my head, why do you think the Lord allowed that to happen in the first place? See, it, it's we are so backward, we'll say, well, the devil attacked me. No, he didn't. I lost all my pictures. The devil assaulted me and took all my pictures. No, he didn't. You're going to lose them all anyway. You really do think that phone is going to keep your pictures forever? Anything can happen to that phone. We don't think in a realistic context. I hear people all the time talk about silly things. They'll say, well, you know... I've got to make sure all these Word documents I have are saved in case an EMP hits. Well, if an EMP hits, what good is a Word document, to be honest with you? People say, well, i got to save my cell phone if an EMP hits. Why? You're not going to be able to talk to anybody on it. For what reason? And then I hear folks say, you have to get shortwave. It's the only thing that, listen, they can jam shortwave right now. Shortwave can be jammed so efficiently that you'll be waving very shortly after your shortwave doesn't work. People are going to be in distress because all their backup plans didn't work. There are certain types of radiation that can contaminate your food. Worst thing you think, most of the lead on the planet is altered. That's not pure materials that we're working with here. 
My lord, we and people still think titanium is as strong as metal on earth. It is not. What I'm telling you is that we believe everything presented to us. And we act like it's law. And we become experts on what somebody else tells us. We need revelation. Stop living a life of limitations. And receive revelation, which is knowledge directly from the Father to you. That you'll know where you must go, what you must do, how to walk, and everything else. Stop living by this materialistic mindset. We're going to examine that when we come back. I'll be right back. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, I am back again. Can you guys hear me okay? I don't want to become too loud here. Hopefully. All right, we are back. I can see you guys. Let me adjust this microphone. No bond tonight, they say. Yes, he, he did tell me that, so thank you guys. Yeah, no, he's going to restart... Um, Monday, I believe he said. Monday. Yeah. He'll restart Monday. Okay? Back to material. Folks, this is a family discussion. Right? For anybody to hear. But I'll tell you, I just, you know, I have a heart for you guys. And so back to science. Trusting mankind has taken... And, and th listen, there's nothing wrong with science, right? There's nothing wrong with science to understand how things work for the good of humanity. There's nothing wrong with it in that respect, in that regard. But we make the mistake, not them. They're, they're, people are going to do what they do. We make the mistake of placing our trust outside of the Father too much. We do it too much. And it comes out in our speech. Right? It comes out in our arguments, debates. It does. We refute. You, you cannot believe, have a belief based upon evidence only and walk by faith. That doesn't mean you believe the silly things. But if the Lord told you that you can make it, you can. Just because you see it as impossible does not mean it's impossible. And, and what I mean by this, there's so many people in the house of God who they claim that God is above all things in their life, but the truth is, he is not. Because if that were the case, you would never doubt him. Nor would you doubt his word. But we have become flaw finders, not fault finders, flaw finders. We look for holes and gaps. We want evidence and proof. We want to be sure about things. Well, the only way to be sure about spiritual things is to walk it out trusting in God the entire time. At the end of a matter, that trust is sealed by the truth but that's not how we walk if we can't see it we're just simply not going to walk in that area we become afraid don't we don't we become afraid oh it's scary to walk there I've not been here before and that's where trust in the Lord is measured most people stay with what is comfortable, thus they don't grow, and their situation stays with them their entire lives. The Lord didn't do that to you, you did that to you. Hmm. Part of that is materialism. We have learned to look and then to trust, to see, then to make a decision. Well, with the Lord, we were we have a built-in knowing. But you're afraid to operate by that knowing because of failure. How many of you have failed at many things in your life? How many? Everybody, right? Every single last one of you. How many are afraid to fail? Again, 
Maybe you're afraid to fail a person. Maybe you're afraid to fail your family. Maybe you are afraid to fail at your job. Maybe you're afraid to fail at anything. It's a hindrance in your life. My Lord, it's a hindrance in your life. It will stop you cold. You cannot reach your full potential that way. Now, I'm not saying go out and try everything. No. We were in prayer yesterday. <clears throat> because you need to know, how do you know when to go and how do you know when not to go? Well, it's like, how, t how do you know who to pray for? Right? If you're afraid of failure, listen up. When you pray, how do you pray for someone? You find out information through somebody else. Don't you? Hmm? Then you know, you think you know what to pray for sometimes. At least you know you have to pray. You may not know what to pray for, but at least you know you have to pray. You want to pray, right? Is that correct? When you find out somebody's life has gone astray or something is not right with someone, then you may not know what to pray for. But you have a desire to pray, correct? And we think that is sufficient. So let, let's analyze this. So somebody tells you, you find out somebody's life is not quite what it should be, right? Then it tugs at you and you say, yes, I'm going to pray for so-and-so. And then we really think we have done something. Now, we may not know what to pray for, again, but we have a desire to pray for the individual, to petition the Father for that individual, right? That's a good thing. That's a good thing. It really is a good thing. But it's not complete. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> I was waiting on a question from you guys. You know who you are. I'm not going to put you on the spot because you're powerful people. I was waiting for someone to say, well, who do we pray for today? But you guys never said it. I was watching, but you didn't say it. I wanted you to say it so I can give you an answer. Because I told you of no one's situation save one, correct? No doubt you wanted to know who's next. Who can we pray for now? For what situation can we pray for? How many people have done that before? How is so-and-so? So you would know whether to pray or not, correct? You do that by what? Evidence. You're praying by evidence. And what I mean by that is that you're finding out somebody needs intercession. That's how you find out. But I was waiting for somebody to say, well, who do we pray for today? So I want to share this with you. Simply because nobody says anything or doesn't know anything does not mean you can't know exactly who to pray for and exactly what to pray for. That's in the life of a Christian. And let me tell you how. I'm not talking about a broad prayer. I'm talking about a specific prayer. Uh-oh. Without you knowing the individual, but you know the circumstances exactly. You know exactly what's going on, and it touches you and you petition, but nobody told you anything. You didn't find out anything through the grapevine, any other contact, or any other way. How many would like to do that? Do you not know the doors open to you always to do that? Let me tell you how. See, if you think with a materialistic mindset, you really do believe, well, you can't pray for someone if you don't know what to pray for. I've heard you guys say it yourselves. But there's a step before prayer you were supposed to be in, and then the prayer comes. What is the first step? meditating upon the things of the Lord. That's what the first step is for you to petition to the Lord, to teach you some things, to dwell with him, to have intimate time with him. And that door is open because when you do this, he will begin to point you in directions. You don't think it's real, do you? I've done that a couple of times myself, gave the names of an entire family accurate as it could be. Knew everything, scared that family to pieces, and I said, don't be scared, that's the Holy Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit 
has knowledge of and it has knowledge of all things, it may depart to the vessel that is sent to help you. Do you know how many Christians would not believe it, but those who witnessed it were also scared to death? How can you be scared to death by the operation of the Holy Spirit? When you find out it's real, people start running. It's not some psychic thing. Long time ago, I stopped doing things. I did. I said, Lord, no, 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 no more. No more. Because people were swearing up and down, well, he hacked my computer. No kidding, they did. They thought it was DHS, had their phones tapped, had their computer compromised or something. They did. Why? Because I knew details that they didn't tell a soul. And it wasn't to call out the details to harm them. It was to let them know I'm praying for them in truth. And they were afraid of the Holy Spirit and began to say, that's impossible. This is what they were saying. So I just stopped. I couldn't do it anymore. I said, no, Lord, I can't do that anymore. Because they were people, they just weren't ready for that. They weren't ready. When you meditate upon the Lord's word and with the Lord all throughout your day, he will point you in precise things to say and do all the time. To trust in the Lord is to trust him to give you things at the appropriate time. You see, materialism, that mindset will have you get things together before something happens. That's not how it works with the Lord. The Lord gives you precisely what you need at the moment you need it. Materialism, the worldly way, is different. And if you don't, here's the sad part. If you were stripped of material things right now, 90% of us would be in the dumps. We'd feel like a failure. Wouldn't we? Have you ever had a lack of something and you felt like a failure? How about you couldn't help someone with substance and you felt like a failure, like you were no good, like you couldn't assist anybody, like you were nothing? And then you have thoughts, well, I should just end it all. I can't do anything for anybody. See, that's what I'm talking about, materialism. That's precisely what I'm talking about. It has defined us. Anything that can alter your attitude... And steal your joy and compromise your faith and spirit has been placed above the Lord your God in your life. If all things are below the Lord your God, how can anything steal your joy? How can anything speak louder than your father does? How? But that's not what's happening with us. You see, we have been defined by our stuff, and it's called comfort materialism. Comfort. We gain things to feel comfortable. We try to feel right in the flesh, forever feeding the flesh. Well, I just don't feel too good. Maybe if I go out and buy matching curtains, I'll feel better. If I can just fix this part of the wall, I'd be okay today. Materialism. What does that broken wall have to do with your attitude? You guys following me? Can you see something here? Oh, and it's sneaky. It is deceptive. And it's hurting people. They, li they are living a life of misery. With a phony smile, but they're broken inside. Because they don't have enough stuff to satisfy their flesh. Folks... Are you following me? Are you listening? Hmm? So what is that? That means you're vested in materialism, the first element in this spiritual war. And make no mistake, it is a spiritual war. To break free, to be free from this world, and you can do that right now, is to be free from materialism and all of its vices. All of its vices, not some, all of its vices. I saw that Tatum is, what about uh, fasting? We'll get to that. We'll get to that.
Does it help? We'll get to that, Tatum. We'll get to fasting, the purpose of it. I know that people have broken down in encyclopedias, and the same people who wrote this stuff have no yield of the Holy Spirit in their lives. Because we're not dealing with this, the, the uh, fake Holy Spirit that mankind has organized, classified, categorized. They even have the steps it takes to get it. All that nonsense. We're not speaking about that. We're speaking about what thus saith the Lord. The real things, the true things, the absolute things. It's what we're speaking about. Folks, I have one interruption. I expected one, I did, because of the topic. Now, I'll be right back, okay? The trampling of Jerusalem underfoot, that's not an evil act. Most of you see that as something horrific, harsh, and everything else. You can't understand why the Lord would allow that to happen. His love, that's why. You see, sometimes everything in a person must be broken all the way, or they will not turn to the Lord. You ever try to do something your way? And you'll tell everybody, I don't know how to do it, but you keep doing it your way. Somebody advises you on the way to do it concerning the Lord, and you're not strong enough to do it, and you keep doing it your way. So the truth is, the only way you can be broken, right, is by God who will tie everybody's hands up where they can't do a thing. They can't bail you out anymore. Then when you're broken, then you'll see the truth before it's too late. He'll do it every single time. He'll do it to me. He'll do it to anybody because he loves us. Sometimes people, they say, well, I'm going to be in a bad light. I'm going to tell you the truth. I don't care if I'm in a bad light to you. I want to be truthful. I'm going to grow in the Lord. I don't need a hindrance. Do you know what happens if I fall flat on my face? You may fall on your face too. If I, with a fake face and a fake spirit, walk forward in fakeness, I will destroy you. That's why you never hear me repeat those things that other people have said, do you? No, no. I can't talk to somebody else's experience time that uh, you know we're gonna understand the nature of this war now I'm gonna give you one aspect of war spiritual war that we're in right now so that we can make corrections folks it is my intention I don't want to see anybody beguiled away from the gospel of Jesus Christ what does that mean that means we have no doctrine worth telling but the Lord Jesus has already spoken things have already been decreed revelation has been given we have enough. Now it's time to operate in what the Lord gave us and stop looking for this, these new things because we don't agree with the old things or the established things. So we're going to talk about the first portion of the nature of the warfare that's getting everybody. And do you guys have an idea of what the battle, the first battle, the battle that's taking place right now is something you're going to have to overcome or you probably won't make it? Why do I say you won't make it? We also have to clarify something. Many of you have a question. Once saved, always saved. That pops up now and again, doesn't it? Certainly popped up in the chat room one late night. People thinking that uh, here's their thoughts. Once you give your life to Christ, that one time you're forever saved, right? Isn't that what people believe? How many of you in the chat room believe that? Because we're family, you can, you can answer honestly. Don't ever be embarrassed. To answer something honestly we had a precious brother by the way who gave me his testimony I did read his testimony I'm not going to mention the name but a precious brother but I did not respond to him concerning his testimony all right so he didn't know what to think he didn't know what to think and um, the other day yesterday I believe it was uh, the evening hours if I'm not mistaken you have to forgive me I've been working uh, a lot here lately a lot I will continue to do so, so don't advise me to get some rest. I will not. I will do whatever it takes, whatever is necessary to get through a few things. But uh, this gentleman sent his testimony, and he thought, he really thought his testimony offended me. Right? He did. Now, there was a time gap between the testimony and the time when we actually spoke about it. And um, he thought uh, that somehow I was offended by his testimony. He told a truth of himself. What he didn't know 
he didn't know how I felt about it because of no response, right? So anyway, we cleared that up. And I told him something I really meant. I don't know anybody unless I know what they're capable of in both darkness and light. I don't know you if all I see is light. If all I see is the good part of you, I don't know you. And, and to be frank with you, there's no one I can trust unless I see the dark side of them. Now, you would think it's the good side that makes you love a person, not with me. It's the dark side that makes me love a person. The dark side is what you really are in the earth. The side of light, right? The side of light is your transition, your change, what the Lord is doing in your life. I've tried to contact and only makes me care for a person much more when I see the dark side. I'm not impressed with light. Light, the light side of you, the, the part that is truthful and right is where you are supposed to be. The dark side of you is where you came from. I don't know a person who just shows me what they're supposed to be. Right? But to know a person... You must know their fallacies. You must know where they're capable of falling from so that you can truly protect them. If I knew that a brother would fall because of alcohol, right? I wouldn't plan a trip. And on every route, there's a bar or a store where you can buy alcohol. I wouldn't do that. Sometimes we think backward. And we have no repair in our lives. That gentleman is on his way to one of the greatest victories one can witness. So you have to fall way down in the dumps to begin to confess who you really are. That's how you know somebody's going to have the greatest victory. That's how you know they're going to break free all the way. I find that precious. All right? Mm. But this is about family. And I know that you have not had good examples of family in your lives, not everybody, nor have I. But my example is Christ and Jesus, right? Jesus Christ, the Father, the prophets, and the disciples, and the apostles, the children of Israel. Angela, a few times, there's no response. I, at last I heard Angela was with her sister. She was with her sister. Her sister... Uh, is in the she's been in the hospital for a long time and uh, sometimes she goes back and forth and, and so Angela's with her sister I believe she said uh, somebody said she was in the ICU okay so lift her and her family up lift her and her family up if you would please but uh, I, I don't have any status I've been trying to get one I haven't heard from Angela in a few days so um, keep her lifted up just keep her lifted up Okay. Do that. She's a precious woman of God. And um, all of us are human beings. And aren't we? And sometimes we go through things we've not gone through before, and it can be quite tasking. So keep her lifted up as best you can. All right. All right. The gentleman, by the way, when he shared of himself, the depths of his life. I thought that to be precious. Right? You have to understand, I'm a person who is, uh, has old ways, I guess you could say that. Right? Having been on the battlefield, I don't trust anybody who shows me goody two-shoes all the time. I can't do that. I need to know the whole person. I have to know what that person cannot do and what they can do. 